we're in chapter 10 of, of Romans and we're uh, going to be looking at, at verses 14 through 21. But I want to, what I want to do, we're going to just jump right into it here in a moment, but I want to lay a little bit of context uh, that leads into the passage that we're covering today. And to do that, we're going to just back up to Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 9, and read uh, the, the passages of Scripture leading right up to it. So this is what it says. He says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and for with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be ashamed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is generous toward all who call upon him. For everyone, I love that word, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, when it comes to the simple gospel salvation truth, if you call upon Jesus, you will be saved. You can, you can tell that to a, a, a kindergarten child, or I can tell that to the most educated adult in the world. It doesn't make any difference. Everybody can grasp that. Everybody can understand that. It's a simple truth that doesn't need a lot of nuance, except that is to say that, that it must be a true confession uh, when you're calling upon the name of the Lord. This is obviously referring to a true confession, not, not someone who's faking it a confession of faith in Jesus for whatever reason to impress somebody or something like that, or, or someone who is somehow forced, you know, like back in the crusades, you know, so you couldn't be forced to confessing Jesus as Lord. But, but, but after unpacking this simple gospel message from all, from all of the complexity the, the, of all of Romans leading up to this point, Paul is now going to deal with some possible objections to this simple message that you are saved by faith. So we'll pick it up in verse 14, and this is what he says. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring good news of good things. Now, there are many questions in this, this passage right there, question after question after question. And, and, and he really does, he doesn't even necessarily try to answer those questions. He just asks one question and then another, then another. And when we, when we see him using questions, I think it's important to think about how Paul uses questions in his writings. He, he uses questions a few different ways in the New Testament in, in his writings. And one of the ways he uses questions is by, <clears throat> excuse me, by using a rhetorical question. And, and he, he uses a rhetorical question at times to, to deny the whole mindset behind the person asking the question or just to simply try to make an obvious statement, a question that's very obvious to say no to the question. An example of that would be Romans chapter 6, verse 15. <clears throat> And there he says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. And when he says, God forbid, he's making it clear. This is a rhetorical question. He, he's saying like, no way, no way. You don't sin because you're not under the law, because that would be a total misunderstanding of the gospel message. So he asks this, this question to have a rhetorical no. Uh, at other times, Paul does something else, and he does something different with his questions. And, and I think this is what's happening in the passage in, in Roman. I don't think this, these questions are about a rhetorical no. It's, it's about helping you think through a process. It's about helping you go from one place of thinking to another place of thinking to, to draw out the logical conclusions of what he's trying to get across. Let me give you another example of that. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Here is Paul trying to get you to think about something with a question, trying to lead you to a specific conclusion. He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, speaking of the communion cup, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? So he, he, he wants us to think about the implications of, of the, of the communion, of the, of the cup that we receive, that, that it's, it's the communion of the blood of Christ. He, he goes on and said, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So he's, he's trying to draw out the idea that in communion there is fellowship with Christ and there's fellowship with each other as, as the body of Christ. And he, he wants the believers here to 
think about these things because the Corinthian believers had kind of watered down the power and the wonder and the, the sort of the theological masterpiece of communion. So he's trying to get them to think it through in this passage. And I think this is, that's what's happening here in Romans. So let's look at these questions in verses 14 and 15. It, it, it's a thought process that started when he established that salvation is going to come, come through grace and through faith, uh, you know, where I'm just going to believe and I'll get saved. So, so then he says, he starts off, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? If you, if you have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, you're not going to call upon him if you don't believe in him. That's the first place he start. Again, Again, empty calling upon the Lord is not the, what not going to work here. You need real belief and real faith when you call upon Him. And, and so you see the process. If I'm going to call, I have to believe. If I'm going to believe, I have to hear. If I'm going to hear, then I have to have a preacher. That's the process that he's trying to lead through. And Paul is just trying to get us to recognize that people need to preach the gospel. I think that's what he's trying to do here. He's, the conclusion is, and I like this because of what I do for a living, preachers are good. The preachers are necessary because how are people going to call on Jesus if they need, never hear about Jesus? The, the, the process of salvation begins with the one who tells another the good news of Jesus. That's where it starts. There, there can be no call, no belief, no, no hearing, no preaching unless there, there are those sent to share the good news. And in verses 14 and 15, I think Paul's, one of the things he's doing is he's trying to highlight the need for people to pre preach the gospel. It's like an intense need. Is, I mean, is there anything in life more valuable, more, more important, more, uh, more uh, valuable or more important than the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus to the world? I mean, I can't think of anything. What else has payoff for eternal life? Nothing. So, so to affirm this, Paul quotes from Isaiah. He quotes Isaiah and he says, As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring good news of good things. Now this shows me that he's not saying a rhetorical no with the question. He's affirming something that is true. He, he's saying this is true. We need to preach to people. And the description of them is, is of them having beautiful feet. Now, why are their feet beautiful? Now, let, let's face of it. Face it. You know, most of us, especially the older we get, the, the less beautiful our feet are. You know, and some of us, you know, our, our feet were not very particularly attractive to begin with. You know what I'm saying? And older we get, the, the less beautiful the feet are. But he's not literally saying that their feet are, are literally beautiful here. It's, it, it's that back then, uh, messages were delivered in a different way. You know, nowadays, messages come through electronic devices for the most part, right? Uh, but back then, they weren't coming through that, uh, the electronic, electronic devices. They weren't, messages weren't received by getting a text or, uh, or, or a message on Facebook or for live streaming on Facebook. The messages were coming through people who were carrying a message by foot from one town to another. So the, so the anticipation of when that, that news person shows up in town with messages for people in that town, oh, how beautiful are the feet of these people that are carrying this message. They're, they're bringing us news from our loved ones. They're bringing us news from our family. Well, how much more wonderful then is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ than and when you share the good news, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful for those that hear. And I wonder, how, how, are you motivated to share the gospel? Are you motivated to share the gospel? I, I find that in my Christian life over the years, it, at times it's, it's been a battle in my own heart to proclaim the gospel, to, to tell people about the gospel. I, you know, I mean, we, we say things like, well, I'm just not exactly sure what to say and or maybe they don't want to hear it right now. Maybe now's just not the right time to share it. And we have all of these concerns and worries. And, but, but if those concerns and worries result in, in my never sharing the gospel, then I must be doing something wrong because I, I'm sure that's not his plan. Uh, you know, when we talk about preaching the gospel, we, we live in times when people 
are more worried about the style with which people share the gospel than they are whether or not they actually share the gospel at all, it seems to me. You know, and I'll give you an example of this that I, I think, you know, some of you will understand, but I think street preachers, open air preachers are an example of this. I don't know if you've ever heard a street preacher preaching on a street corner, you know. It's easy to walk past them and hear them and, and think to yourself, they're loud. Loud is abrasive. I don't know if that's the right way to share. And, and I know, you know, I mean, there have been times I walk past somebody and I, I've had those kind of thoughts enter in my mind. But, but the thing is, if you, if you look at what the Bible says, you'll, you'll see that what they're doing is, is not a whole lot different than what the apostles did or from what Jesus did and certainly what John the Baptist did. Um, I mean, read what these guys did. Read the, the text in the book of Acts or in the, in the Gospels. But you, you know what's interesting to me? I, you know who, who, are, who the biggest critics of open air street preachers are? The biggest critics uh, of those preaching on the streets are, are often Christians. You know, there, there'll be some street preacher out there on the street corner preaching the gospel. And, and, and who is it? And maybe, maybe if, you know, if you're living in a smaller community, you haven't seen this, but, but who is it that often comes up to him and tells him to stop, stop talking? Well, often it's, it's another Christian. Uh, a Christian walks up you know, and says, judge not, which is the only verse that they actually know, taking it completely out of context. Or they say something like, you're, you're embarrassing the rest of us. You're making it hard for me to be able to tell anybody, anybody about Jesus when the reality is they're actually not ever telling anybody about Jesus. You know, but, but if we look at the scriptures, we see Jesus as an example. He went around, went around proclaiming the kingdom of God. And if you read what he said, Jesus went around preaching to people to repent for the kingdom of God is, was at hand. And then he, he sent the disciples out and he told them, when you go around, when you go door to door, house to house, town to town, he said, tell people to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That was John the Baptist's message too. And, and if, if that's not consistent enough, you have, you have the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, you have the apostles going around and what do they tell people to do? What do they tell them to do? They tell people repent. Their message was not go to church. Now, you know, we, we nowadays, we say, well, if I can just get them to go to church. I don't think that's a good, that's a good starting place. I want people to come to church. But, but, but we have to understand this. The preaching of the gospel is not really an at-church event. And it can happen at church. It can happen there. But it's really a body of Christ thing that we do as we go around and, and we go about our daily lives. And, and I'm not talking about standing on a corner and, you know, with a Bible in your hand and preaching a three-point sermon. I, we're misunderstanding the whole concept there because what we're talking about is telling people the gospel of Jesus. Now, it may be in the context of standing on a street corner and with a, with a, a, a loudspeaker and, and preaching the gospel, or it might be in the, in the context of having a conversation with a neighbor out in your yard when you've both just finished mowing the lawn and you're talking about life and you're telling them about the gospel of Christ. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you look at what the, the, the apostles, they responded to people uh, in situations, that, you know, like Peter on the day of Pentecost. They're like, Peter, what do we do? And he goes, oh, well, read the Bible and pray and ask God to reveal himself to you. No, no, that's not what he said. He said, repent. Repent. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells them to repent and turn to Christ and be, be saved. You know, I'm, I'm thinking nowadays, modern day Americans and, and many people around the world, if, if, if they had the opportunity where they could travel back in time and just sort of sit back and, and witness Paul in action or or Peter, or Stephen, or, or these other guys in the book of Acts who were preaching, I think a lot of them, uh, would, would, we would look, they would look at them and say, well, that's just not, that's not the way to do it. They, they would say, I mean, you can, you can do it that way if you want to, but it's just, it's just not going to work. And, and that's, to me, that's like the last ditch effort of the person resisting the preaching of the gospel when they can't fight against the fact that it's biblical. When they can't go against you with scripture, when, they, when you show them that Jesus did it, that John did it, that the apostles did it, and they told us to do it, when you get all of this out and, and they say, fine, fine, you can do it that way, but it won't work in today's world. 
Well, you know what? To that I say, wrong. Wrong. It, it's just not true. It, it's, not, it's simply not true that it doesn't work. Many, many people have been saved this way. Re, read the book of Acts. If, if you believe the scripture, then you believe that 3,000 souls were added to the church on the day of Pentecost by hearing an open air preacher. Now, the world's response uh, to people who are trying to share the gospel is different. The world's response to people trying to, the, trying to share the gospel is typically persecution. Often, I should say, not necessarily typically, but often it's persecution. But I want you to know it's, it's interesting that persecution does not usually start with violence or threats. That's not, it doesn't usually start off at a high level. Persecution, persecution typically starts... With shh, shh, this isn't the place. Just, just stop. Nobody wants to hear this. This isn't the time. This isn't the way. This isn't the style we like. Just stop. Or they'll say, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but you should keep that private. Shh. The world tries to keep us quiet. The apostles were, I mean, you can see in the book of Acts, the apostles were told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. They said, you can do everything else you want to do. You can have your food ministry. You can do all the different things you're doing, but just stop proclaiming the name of Jesus. Stop telling people that they need to repent and put their faith in Jesus. That's, listen, that's the beginning of persecution, being told to shut up, being told to stop telling people about Jesus. That's the beginning of persecution. And if you bow to it, then that very low level persecution ends. If, if there's, there's no further persecution uh, when, you, when you bow to the, those that are demanding silence, if you just stop talking, then they're happy. Everything's good. However, if you continue to speak up and proclaim the gospel, that's when persecution begins to intensify. Be and the reason is because the shh didn't work. And I'm only saying this because to see it in the book of Acts. You know, listen, Satan wants to shut down Christians and he wants to make us be quiet because he wants to end the preaching of the gospel. You know, there was a church in California. They had an outreach a number of years ago and there was a preacher that they invited and, and they came, he came to the outreach and, and, was, and they had to set up, you know, with a little stage there and they were doing this outreach out in the public and, uh, and somebody complained about it. Somebody in the church complained about it. And the, th the thing was that, that this man was kind and he was funny, but, but he shared the gospel. He, he shared, yep, you, you've sinned. What's going to happen when you stand before God? You need a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. What are you going to do? Will you repent and put your faith in Jesus and tr trust in Jesus Christ? It was confrontational because that's when you approach somebody and say, you have sin in your life, but Jesus has, a, has, has the power to be able to set you free from that. He can forgive you. That's, that's confrontational. But, so it was confrontational, but it was loving, and it was gracious, and, and it was even humorous. But there was one family in the church that complained about it. So the group of pastors heading the outreach said, well, well, we'll just hand out tracts, and we won't have anybody on the stage. And there, and there were other people involved in the outreach that were heartbroken broken over that. One family complained. Why? You know why they complained? They complained because they didn't understand the biblical preaching of the gospel. They were Christians. I'm not going to deny that they were, that they were, they were not Christians, but, but, but they didn't understand the biblical preaching at all. And so what ended up happening was their complaint was, was taken way too seriously. And, you know, we, we should take Scripture seriously far more seriously than we do the complaints. But you know, there, there's another style attack, I'll, I'll say, that, that we get against the preaching of the gospel. And this is one that's more internal, and it's more of an excuse that we use. Uh, but there's an old quote that people like to, to, to say, and it goes like this, and you've probably heard it. It says, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. If I'm sorry, if necessary? Okay, now I get that we need to live a righteous and loving life before the world. That's important. That's absolutely vitally important for us as Christians 
uh, to, to do that as we share the gospel. But if, you know, somebody once asked the pastor, don't you think that when my wife and I go and sit in a coffee shop and drink coffee and, you know, we pray over our donut or whatever, don't you think that we're proclaiming the gospel? Well, let's think about that for a minute. Uh, no. The answer is no, you're not. And neither am I when I'm doing something like that. Now, I may, be, I may be portraying something godly in my relationships with other people. I may be sending a message and helping them to see some things. I might be encouraging people to be helpful, helpful and loving and those sort of things. But here's the deal. The gospel is specific information about Jesus, and it is not gained simply by watching other people's lives. It is gained by hearing their word. That's the nature of the gospel. In fact, I mean, the word itself, preach, does not mean live godly. Preaching the gospel is a word thing. It involves a message that you actually get out of your mouth or you put on a piece of paper in writing or you, you sign language it to people who can't hear or you use a needle and put it in braille. Whatever you do, somehow or another, you get specific information across to people. And you know, this seems pretty basic, but it's just lost on so many people in our world today. The, the phrase that, that quote it should say, preach the gospel at all times. Use words. That's what it ought to say. Uh, it, it, it just, let's just take the if necessary out because words are necessary to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because, you know, in the task of evangelism, an effective witness must include more than a good example. Now, it's understandable. Now, listen, I understand. A, a poor example can ruin your words. It can, it, can, it can rob you of all credibility. However, a, a great example without the words just leaves people confused. Leaves them with questions because eventually someone will have to explain the content of the gospel, the what and the how of the gospel. Modeling the Christian life is important, but somebody has to be able to make the connection between the mind of the unbeliever and the message of the gospel. You know, where, where, where we have to be able to explain to people, you see how I live my life, let me tell you why I live my life this way. So it's not one or the other, it's a combination. People need to know why you act differently. Otherwise, they're just left to guess why you act the way you do. And they may come up with just a simple explanation of saying, well, they're just a nice person. Well, them walking away thinking you're a nice person, they are not getting the gospel through that, are they? It's not a bad thing. I mean, I hope you are known as a nice person. That's a good thing. But people cannot respond to the gospel without someone proclaiming it to them. How will our loved ones and neighbors hear about Christ unless someone tells them? God is calling you to be part of making His message known in your community. And here's what I want you to understand, because a lot of us get tied up and we say, I don't know how, I just don't think I have it. Well, God is not looking for our great abilities in evangelism. He is merely looking for our availability. He has this reputation of taking things that are not enough and making them more than enough. So when you realize I'm not enough to be able to be effective in sharing this gospel, you're putting yourself in a great position to be able to say, but God can take this not enough and make it more than enough to tell somebody about Jesus. Reminds me of the great passage in Isaiah 6. He said, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah speaking, he said, and I said, here am I. Send me. You know, in today's world, I can, I can almost hear the voice of God asking who will go for him. And far too often, our answer is we hear God say, who will go for me? And we say, here am I. Send him. Send somebody else. Not me. I'll live the life, but don't, don't ask me to say anything. But the truth is, we've already been sent. We've already been sent. The, this passage not only declares the need for sending people out with the message of the good news, but it declares that God has already sent people out. And it talks about the refusal of, of the Israelites to believe the message that was given to them through the prophets. But the principle is that God has sent us to the world so that they can have the opportunity to either accept or reject God's invitation. 
So this brings up some natural issues. In verse 16, Paul's going to deal with it. He, he says, but they have not all, all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Now this is from Isaiah 52, uh, 7. Uh, the, uh, actually, I don't think it's verse 7. I think it's verse 1. But the passage in, in Isaiah is, uh, is right before, it's the very beginning of, of, of the great messianic passage from Isaiah. Probably the greatest messianic, messianic passage in, in the whole book of Isaiah. The, and it talks specifically, actually we're going to talk some about it Sunday in our service. Uh, it talks specifically about how Jesus was bruised and how he took stripes on his back. Uh, uh, and, and talks about how he bore our iniquity and our sin, and it talks about how the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, and, and it's just this beautiful, beautiful passage about God's incredible uh, sacrificial love for us. But, but right before all of that, what does he say right before that? He says, Lord, who has believed our report? And he said, then he goes on with this, and that's, that's in the middle. of it. You go from verse chapter 51 into chapter 52 of Isaiah. You begin to put it all together, and you begin to realize he's giving this explanation, this prophecy about the coming Messiah and the suffering servant and all of these beautiful things. Uh, but he's saying, Lord, who has believed? Who's, 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 who's believed our report? So, so look at the flow here. Why does Paul quote this verse? This passage is directed toward Jews very, very strongly. And Paul's following Old Testament logic. It goes like this. The need for a preacher brings up an obvious issue. And this is, this is what he's addressing. A person could easily say, and we, we actually talked a little bit, a lot more in depth about this concept last week, uh, but, but he, a person could easily say, well, no one ever told me. No one ever told me. You just said that I have to have a preacher to be able to hear, and if I hear, then I can believe, I can have faith. But no one ever told me. And that introduces that idea that billions of people are unsaved simply for the lack of hearing. We talked about that last week, but the, the truth is uh, no one is ever condemned for not, uh, not believing in Jesus. They're condemned for the sin before that. That's just another sin added on to it. The sin of unbelief is not this, what sends them to hell. That's just what keeps them in the place where they're on their way to hell. Uh, but, but, but that's not the only reason. So, so that idea of not hearing is not the only reason why they're not being saved. Therefore, to deal with that issue, Paul says, he says, let's, let's take it as an example, those who did hear. And let's ask the question, do people all get saved when they hear the gospel? So Paul says, Lord, who has believed our report? Because Isaiah, his point is, Isaiah shared these things and there were many people and many prophets, not just Isaiah, who Israel rejected the word of the Lord. Uh, and, and it seems that in particular with Israel in Isaiah's time, he was like, who, who even believes the things I'm bringing? God has called me as, a, as his messenger. I'm bringing the words of God, but who even, even believes it? Who even receives it? And and the reality is no one will be ever, ever be able to say, oh, if, if someone had just told me because, and we talked a lot more about this last week, there are things that they have heard, but they reject it. And I think that this is a real commentary on, on humankind. How hard, it has, it's not a statement about God, but how hard hearted are we that we hear the gospel and we reject it, that we just casually cast it off. And, and I've, heard it, I've heard it rejected for the silliest reasons, you know. So he says, oh, I'll, I'll do it later. Oh, okay, you'll do it later? So, so what that really means is you're saying no. Why? Well, you know, there are just some things that I want to do in my life before I, before I uh, give my life to Jesus. Well, well, things like what? I mean, things like family? Uh, love, uh, you know, being a productive member of society, things like that. Well, no, no. Things like sin, <laughs> things that I know I shouldn't be doing. That's what I want to do. And it just shows the hard heart of mankind that really we reject the gospel just simply because, I mean, when they say that, it's because they say, no, I, I don't want to do it right now because I don't want to repent. I don't want to turn my back on things that I know are sinful. 
It's just a hard heart. Now, now I want to mention something that really interesting that's related to what we've been talking about here. Uh, the thing is, everybody who says, everybody who asks the question, what about those who've never heard? Everyone who asks that question has heard. Ever think about that? They wouldn't be asking that question if they hadn't heard themselves. You know, I, I, I've dealt with the issue of those who have never heard, but let me deal with the, for a second with those who ask, what about those who have never heard? Because they ask that question as an excuse against God, as a way to say, you know, there are those who have never heard. If they're going to be condemned, then God is an immoral God, so I don't have to follow him. So they're using that question as an excuse. What about those who've never heard? Well, the, the, my, my statement, my question is in response, well, you've obviously heard or you wouldn't be asking the question. So my question is, what about you? What about you? It's not about all those other people. It's about you. You have heard. What will the judgment be for those who hear and reject the gospel? What about those who hear and then just ignore and reject those things? See, the, the issue with many of the Jewish people of Paul's time, not all of them, but many of them, was that they simply had a lack of faith. It wasn't a lack of hearing. And he's going to get into that more and more as we, as we look in this passage. You know, the, the truth is we can expect the same today. Bringing people good news does not guarantee a welcome. Have you, have you ever learned that? Have you figured that out? That even somebody in a really tough, very difficult situation, sometimes when you go to them and talk to them about the Lord and His love for them and His salvation, that even in that situation, sometimes they, just, they still just won't receive it because of the hardness of their heart. But here's what we have to understand. We are not held responsible for how other people respond. But we are held responsible for carrying out the command of sharing the good news. Let's look at verse 17. The very, very famous verse. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, so Paul He's like, so here's the conclusion. If you're going to believe in Jesus and call on him, you have to have a preacher. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, this, this verse specifically is talking about saving faith uh, in, in the sense that in the context of what he's talking about, you know, there, there's something mystical about this. Sure. But, but there's also something very simplistic about it as well. It's just simply, I hear God's word. I respond with faith because I believe in what I hear. And so I believe in God. Saving faith comes by hearing the word of God. So again, we go back to the point, we need preachers. And I'm not talking about vocational preachers. I'm talking about people who share the gospel. We do need preachers. But part of the point that Paul is making through here, through this passage, is that, is that the lack of preachers does not become an excuse for the unsaved. That's the nuance that Paul is giving it to us in this. So... So saving faith comes by hearing the word of God. But, but what about stronger faith? What about faith to greater and lesser degrees? I mean, do, do all Christians have the same amount of faith? I mean, I can say in my own life that I have more faith now than I did 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, I had more faith than I did 10 years before that. Certainly, I have more faith now than I, had it, than I have had at earlier times in my life. So, so experientially, we can see that. But we can also say this biblically. Luke 7, 9, uh, Jesus meets a centurion who asked Jesus to come to, to heal. His, he didn't ask him to come. He asked him to heal his son. And Jesus said to him, he said, yes, I will come to your house. I will heal your son. And this guy was like, no, no, you don't even need to come. Uh, I know you can just speak the word. And if you just say it, he's going to be healed. And Jesus said, he said, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. So there was a degree of faith that this man had. Now, in another place, there was another father who asked Jesus to heal his son. He was demon possessed. And the boy, Jesus uh, says that he can heal his son if he believes. And the man's response, and it's one of the most beautiful verses for those who have ever doubted. I don't know if you've, if you've ever doubted. That's probably never happened to anybody in here today. But I have definitely had those moments of doubt where I struggled with that. But this man uh, says to Jesus, and I love it, he says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So here we have a man who has belief and unbelief commingling in the, in the same person. 
Lord, I have unbelief in me, but there's belief in there too. I believe. And he's saying, I choose belief even though I'm struggling with this doubt. And, and what, is, what does Jesus do? He, he heals the man's son. Now, so that would be little faith. It was a small amount of faith, but it was still enough to access God's power and His goodness. And by the way, I want to just say this. Sometimes we think, I have to, I've got to have big faith. But Jesus said, listen, if you have faith the size of a, uh, of a grain of, of mustard seed, you can, you can move mountains. So it's not about how big your faith is. It's, it's where you place your faith. It's about the bigness of, of your God that you have faith in. But, but it is true that there are different levels of faith. This man had a small amount of faith, but it was enough to be able to access God's power and God's kindness, His goodness. The centurion had more faith. But there's, there's another example in the book of Acts chapter 6. It says that Stephen was a man who was full of faith. He was full of faith. He, he didn't just have faith. He was full of faith. And we see it in his the way he lived and his proclamation and his stance for Jesus. And so, so do you see that there are different degrees of faith that we can see that in scripture? There, there is biblical grounding to say that there are greater and lesser degrees of faith, even among the saved. So let me just say this. If, if you're a Christian, you have faith because you can't be saved without faith, right? So every Christian has a, a level of faith to some, some degree, but how much faith do you have? How much faith do you have? And, and now, now here's, you know, I'm sure that somebody has created some online test. You can go find that somewhere. But, but here's the thought. If faith comes by hearing the word of God and I want more faith, maybe I should be in the Bible more. If you want that faith to grow, maybe, I should, maybe you should be in the Bible more. You know, I, I know the study of God's word has really increase my faith, but, but at the same time, I want you to know just hearing it, just reading it has increased my faith. I've had times when I was going through trials and hardships and my heart was down and everybody in this room has, has been in those types of situations, but, but in those moments, there have been moment, times when I have opened up my Bible to the Psalms. I've found anytime I'm downhearted, I love reading in the Psalms because there's so much encouragement there. And, and, and when I opened up the Psalms and just read it, I was encouraged in my faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. This is a good thing to remember. We, sh we should just drench ourselves with the Word of God. If you want more faith, remember faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Let's look at verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Now this is interesting because now you're seeing the link because he's talking about uh, if you're going to get saved, you're going to have faith, you've got to hear the Word of God. Now Paul's making a transition from that truth that he just taught and he's going to make an application to the, to the Jewish people and he's saying, have they not heard? So you catch it because he said faith comes by hearing. Now he's asking the question, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their voice went into all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now, I, I think verse 18, I, I think many teachers miss this verse. They, they read it and they keep going without recognizing how it relates to what has already been said. This is a nuanced truth. The, the question in verse 18 is, have they not heard? And some might, might argue that the Jews weren't given enough chances to hear or somehow the message should have been made clear. You know, perhaps Isaiah's complaint, who has believed in, in my, my report, that maybe that was the fault of the messenger, that nobody really told them or they didn't tell them the right way. But, but Paul emphatically responds that, that of course they heard. You, uh, you, you, so, so this is where the nuance comes from. Indeed, the truth is everybody has heard something of the Word of God because creation itself proclaims the truth of God. We talked about that some uh, last week. We talked about it a number of times in this study. That's, that's what Psalm 19 is all about. And that's where this quote, uh, that, he, that this, this, where it says, Your, their voice went into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. That comes from Psalm 19. And, and Psalm 19 is about... Uh, creation proclaiming the truth of God. Let me read to you the first four verses of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night declares knowledge. There is 
No speech and there are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the uh, end of the world. That's the quote that he used. In them he has set a tent for the sun. And then it, it continues on and, and talks about creation. But then after that it starts talking about the written word of God. So in this you have creation and you also have the written word. Now here's the thing. The written word has not reached every single human being, has it? However, creation has. Romans 1, remember, remember we talked about this. The invisible things about Him, His eternal power and deity have been clearly seen since the creation of the world and are understood by the things that are made so that they are without excuse. So, so why, why is Paul quoting Psalm 19 here? Paul as we've talked about in the past, he quotes the Old Testament in a very strategic way designed to help reach the Jewish person. Uh, because here's the thing, a teacher must not only understand the truth of something, they, not, they don't have to just have a handle on what they're trying to teach, but they have to figure out how to get people on the path to that truth. One idea leading into another idea, leading into another idea, and so on and so forth, until the point where they finally get, they, they finally say, ah, I get it. The, the greatest moments for a teacher are, are when the light bulbs go on in the, in, for the people that they're teaching, and they say, oh, I understand that now. And I think Paul is writing to that very specific Jewish mindset again, like he did in Romans 9, and he's saying to them, yes, you need to hear the gospel to get saved. So does that mean that you have an excuse for having not heard? And the answer comes like this. Let's try to pull it all together to this Jewish mindset. He says, hey, you remember how Psalm 19 talks about how, talks about how everybody should know there's a God? Those Gentiles, they have no excuse for worshiping those false idols because creation declares the glory of God and the earth shows His handiwork. And the Jew hearing that would be like, yeah, that's right. Foolish idols, foolish false religions. They should know there's only one God. How could they not know this? Now, Paul, he's actually setting them up as he often does because now, now that the Jew says, I affirm Psalm 19... God is right. They should know this. The, the Jew would ag agree that, that, the, that the Gentile could have and should have responded to general revelation. But now Paul brings it back to the Jew. And he says to the Jewish reader, you know, you had a lot more than general revelation. You had not only creation, but you had the word of God proclaiming the truths of, truths of Christ before he ever showed up and you rejected him. That's what he's saying to the Jew that, that had rejected Christ. So the Gentiles had general revelation and they're accountable. But Israel, he says, you're accountable too. Look, look at verse 19. But I say, did, not, did Israel not know? So he says, first he says, did they not hear? Now he says, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by those who are not a nation and by a by a foolish nation, I will anger you. So, so let me recap. Everybody has a certain level of accountability. We learn at Romans 1, Psalm 19. Both of those talk about that. But Israel had, had greater knowledge and therefore greater accountability. And this quote is, is, in verse 19 is, is from a, a song that Moses sang uh, at, at the end of Jude, Deuteronomy chapter 32. And ultimately, what happens in Deuteronomy 32 is that Moses predicts that Israel will reject the rock. And I'm not talking about the actor. <laughs> I'm talking about the Jesus uh, that, and that they will turn from God and that because of rejecting him and accepting other things, he will turn then to a foolish people and accept them to make Israel Jewish. Now, here's the thing. If you're not Jewish, then you are what? Gentile, right. So God is saying, if he's going to turn to anybody besides Jews, he's saying that he will embrace Gentiles in order to make the Jewish people jealous. Now, we, th we think of that word jealous in a bad sense, but, but uh, he's trying to help them understand. He's trying to stir up something in them that has uh, a love for God that has grown dormant. So, so what is Paul saying? He, he, he's like, hey, Israel. What is he said, did, did Israel not know? He, he's saying, Israel, you knew this would happen. God bringing us the rock who is Christ. You reject Christ and God embraces Gentiles. Israel, you knew this would happen. 
Again, Paul is just establishing that everything that's happened with Jesus fits a biblical pattern. Therefore, the, the skeptical Jew cannot say God would never turn away from Israel and embrace those Gentiles. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Didn't you know this was going to happen, Israel? Didn't you know? It says, I will make you jealous by those who are not a nation, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. So, so it was not just Jesus that was prophesied. Jesus and His death and His resurrection, they were all prophesied. But also the ripple effects afterwards are prophesied in the text of the Old Testament. By that I mean the rejection of Israel and the embracing of the Gentiles. And we'll get more into that in chapter 11. Let's read on, verse 20. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. Now this is from God's perspective. God is going to be found by whom? By people who do not seek Him. And by people who do not ask for Him. That would be the Gentiles. So, so Paul is making the point. He's saying, Israel, you have, seen, you have the Scriptures. You know that God was going to embrace the, the Gentiles. This has been told to you over the centuries. And to support this point, let me just read some other verses in the Old Testament that talk about how the Gentiles will, will be receiving God. Psalm 22, 7. All the ends of the world will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. All the ends of the world, all the families of the nations will worship before you. Now, now that was from Psalm 22, which is, as we'll actually talk about this Sunday as well, is a deeply messianic psalm about Jesus and the fulfillment not only of his death and resurrection, but also it talks about the ripple effects about how it goes out to the nations of the world. Because see, we talked some last, in the last few weeks about a temporary hardening of Israel, and that temporary hardening is what opened the door for the Gentiles to receive the gospel. So did Israel know? Did they not know? Yes, they knew. Isaiah 52, 15. Uh, this is that great messianic passage. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Not, not many, or excuse me, not one, but many nations. Kings, plural, shall shut their mouths at, at him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall consider. Now the Jews, to this before, they were the ones who had these texts. So they were the ones hearing and considering these things. But after these events happen, the atonement, Jesus' death and resurrection, there are kings who have never ha had these texts who will hear them and they will consider them. Isaiah 49, 6, he says, It is a light thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preservations of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. So this idea is exceedingly biblical. It is clear throughout the Old Testament. So what would keep a Jewish person from being able to receive this? I mean, it's in the text. It's, it's right there. It, it's consistent. Paul is preaching it from the Old Testament in a way that will hopefully draw a person from that Old Testament mindset through these things so that they will understand who Jesus is, why he was rejected by many of the Jews, all of this stuff. What would keep them from being able to receive it? The only thing I can think of is national or religious pride that would keep somebody from accepting these things because it's right here in the, in the Bible. Verse 21, But to Israel, he says, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So those last two quotes, verses 20 and 21, are both from Isaiah 65, verses 1 and 2. And he quotes them back to back. The first one is saying that he'll be found by people who do not seek him, uh, speaking of the Gentiles. But then to Israel, he says in verse 21, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So first of all, this verse points out that the issue is not the knowledge of the gospel, but it's the embrace of that, of that, of that knowledge because they are, they are disobedient and contrary. They don't want to receive it. But this is written out of love for the Jewish person. It's not some sort of racial rejection of the, of the Jewish people. It's not some sort of religious attack on them. This is a fulfillment of the scriptures of the Jewish people that God would bring the Gentiles in and there would be, at least in some sense and for some time, a rejection of His own people. Why? Not because God hates them. Not because of any lack of love. In fact, it says, all day long 
I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient contrary people. So, so the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, it predicts the Messiah. It predicts the acceptance of Yahweh by Gentiles through this Messiah. And it predicts the Jewish rejection of the Messiah for a time. And it predicts the Jews uh, rejecting God, reaching out to them. Uh, uh, not, not all of them, but many of them, unfortunately. But here's the thing. Even during this time of hardening and this time of rejection, God's posture to Israel has not changed. He continues to extend himself to Israel, ready to receive them back when they embrace his message. God will still accept his chosen people if they will only return to him. He remains faithful to his promises to his people, even though they have been unfaithful to him. I love that. God still holds out his hands. And can I tell you, that is not only true for Israel, but God still holds out his hands to the people of this generation. But, but they, will, they will not know that unless we tell them. The arms of God are always open to, to those who will respond to the message with obedience, but they can never obey the message if we don't tell them. Now, this really sets us up nicely for chapter 11 because you have to go, well, if they're rejected, what do you mean by rejected? That's how Paul starts out chapter 11. He says, has God cast away his people? And we'll tackle that next week, but I want to close with this because verse 21 really sort of hits my heart heavily. It says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary pe people. Now, here's the thing. When we read Scripture, it's easy to read it and say, oh, that's for somebody else. But I can't help but think when I read that, I have to be honest and say, Lord, if I'm not careful, that could be me. You might even sense God's love for you and His grace and His kindness and His offer of goodness and His direction in your life, but that doesn't mean just because you hear his voice that you're obeying and you're following it, does it? He might be stretching his hands out to me and, and, and I might be a disobedient and contrary person where I keep ignoring the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life or I keep ignoring the call of the clear teaching of the Word in some area of my life. And, you know, that, that should be uh, something that's to stir us and make us wake up and may, pay attention to what God may be saying to us because when I read that, I need to make sure that that doesn't describe me. Proverbs 29.1 says, He who is often reproved yet hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Hebrews 3.13 warns us, But exhort one another daily while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through, what? through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin creeps in and it deceives us. In that moment, maybe, maybe God is reaching out and saying, listen to my voice. You need to stop doing this. You need to start doing that. And we're hearing him and we know it's the Lord. But here's the thing. If we don't listen, there will be consequences. Now, they may or may not be eternal consequences, but, but you know, I don't know about you, but I don't even, I don't even want non-eternal consequences from God. I don't, want to, I don't want to rob God's glory being shown in my life and through my life because of some rebellion or some foolishness that I've fallen into, fallen into or the, you know, the deceitfulness of sin. So it resolves to this. And this is what I'm going to leave us with tonight. Uh, whatever you know, whatever is clear from the teachings of God's word for our own lives, or it's clear through the through the witness of the Holy Spirit in your own heart, or, or maybe it's through the rebukes of life. Ever, everybody, ever been through those times where you have those rebukes of life where, where you, you just know that through some hardship you're being corrected by God? If you don't believe that happens, read Hebrews chapter 12, and it'll be an eye-opener for you. But whatever, whatever you know, I'm begging you, act on it. Don't let it just be knowledge you have in your head. Act on it. Take action on those things. Purify your heart. Cleanse your hands. Whatever, whatever needs to be done, just make sure that your life is on track with Christ. Just say, my, my eyes are set on Jesus. I'm, I'm laying aside sin. I'm laying aside the weights. I'm, I, and I'm running with endurance the race set before me. 
as, as, I, as I read verse 21, I, I think, I don't want that to be me. I don't want that to be me. You know, Paul will get into this in chapter 11, and he'll, he'll go, don't think you're better than the Jewish people. Just because they're hardened right now, don't think you're better. Because, listen, you know what the difference uh, is between Jews and Gentiles when it comes to spiritual issues? You know what the difference is? There is none. There is no difference. That's the point. God just picked the people that were just like the rest of the world just so that he could demonstrate his grace and bring forth his truth. And the good news is, and we're going to get into this next week, there is great hope for the Jewish people. And we'll get into that in chapter 11. But let's, uh, let's pray together as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that not only would you, would you help us to understand your word, but Lord, that we would understand its application to our lives. Help us, Lord, to, to clearly hear your voice speaking to us about issues in our lives. And Lord, help us to respond when you speak to us. We don't, we don't want to stiffen our necks or harden our hearts by ignoring your voice. So soften our hearts. Help us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Help us to, help, Lord, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and to run with endurance the, the race that you've set out before us. And we ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus.